in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was uh, in front of a big audience via FaceTime. Yes, and I tried to stay awake because questions were thrown at me. But uh, yeah, it all seemed to work fairly well at the end of the day. And then I think I must have gone to sleep. But now here's another girl. <laughs> And of course, we were together last week. Yes, we were born. Yes, we were saving born. Yes, week. indeed. Yeah. Bring one there, so they, they they're like the number thirty-one bus. They <laughs> just all come together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we are. Um, so you must have paid you very generously if you get up three thirty in the morning. No, that paid me anything. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Checks in the post, I suppose. I don't know. But uh, no, I, I sent them a. Uh, a video link. I, I learned more about how to use my computer and how to take pictures of myself. It's all. Excuse me. This, this is the convention in St. Louis Court. Yes, it, it, it could be. Bear with me just one second. Oh, I switched it off. <laughs> Incoming call, Roger. Hello? <laughs> Oh yes, hello. Um, I'm, yes, well, I'm, I can't really speak to you at the moment because I'm actually in front of a rather big audience here in Derby. Um, um, I'll give you a call once I get back home. It'll probably be tomorrow. Is that all right? And uh, that's quite all right. No need to apologise. No, no at all. Um, and we'll, we'll get the, the garden sorted out. <laughs> okay, cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs> Great, yes. Yes, I'll switch this off, mustn't I? Yes. Getting the garden sorted out, why is it needs well, mowing, does it? Oh, it certainly does. Well, yes, it does. I have a nice garden. Um, but it's uh, the weeds uh, taking over and flower beds need digging a little and mm -hmm. stuff like that and and I'm not as old as I used to be. Yes. So there you are. <laughs> right. This is an interesting type of panel. Um, yes. we, are, we, are, we are expecting Colin uh, Payton to join us um, as of well. Of course, of course. Um, it's, but, it's um, compulsory. Yes. yes. But let me let me start by um, you were you actually overlapped on the show. John you were you were in it from seventy seven I believe. That's and then you were still there when uh, Matthew joined. Oh, it was Tom's indeed, yes. Final season. So what can you two tell us about that, that final year of the Tom Baker era? Matthew. <laughs> <let's, let's do. laughs> oh, well, it was very exciting. I was very excited to work with K9. Um, Andrew from K9 got along very well, actually. Yeah. It was always fun. And Andrew, for some reason, Andrew got to sit on K9 more often than most of them did. How was that job? And all our scenes were wonderful. I think Tom Baker would have preferred somebody to sit on K9 very heavily. Yes. Um, not that Tom didn't like me. Yeah. We got on enormously well. It was quite surprising because I don't think he liked the character yeah. uh, of K9 so much. But uh, curiously, the, the dynamic that we worked to uh, was wonderful because originally in rehearsals, I was able to run around being K9 yeah. because the original model, module hadn't been finished yet. Yeah. Right, let me budge over so Colin can take Colin's place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the points are in colour. Oh, nice. But the problem with K9 was the only way to act with him, you had to kind of squat. You had to sort of get down get down on your knees. It was the only way of actually doing a scene with him. Camera centre is a bit of a nightmare. That's right. Yes. yes. That's yes. right. Yeah. Can we uh, take the mic around so that Colin is on mic? Are you sure? <laughs> no, I was going to PA. <laughs> oh, why don't you put it there? It won't reach. It won't reach. Can, 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 can everybody hear? Okay, fantastic. Could you arrange it so they can't hear? <laughs> oh, oh, take it with me. Oh, come, come. I have nothing of interest to say. Oh. But I haven't already said a thousand times. Unless you are an interesting interviewer. Uh, um, this is a question that's never been asked. Well, I think I've got one of those coming. Um, do you want me to give you straight away? Or do you want me well, to get there's other people here. Well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's carry on with uh, K9 and, uh, and Andre for a minute. Yeah, and much, I'll, much, I'll come back to the Much more interesting. In yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
Get on with you. No, no, I, I think I'd said, I'd made the point that I had to yes. about squatting every time you yeah. talk to K9. And, and problematic that was. Well, it was all right for me because I was right at the back of a studio behind a piece of flat or flat something or other. Where you belong. Uh, where I belonged, absolutely yeah. so. Um, and getting terribly embarrassed because the signals that were being, the radio signals being fed into K9 to get him to move weren't working. And I was beginning to feel terribly guilty because I had rehearsed it the way it should have been. Uh, so I always left the studio feeling a little bit, um, uh, how shall I say, um, worried that I'd never be asked to do it again. And then I always was. It was strange. But yes, it bumped, the plane bumped into walls all the time, and, and uh, we never... No, I did it. Uh, nowadays, you yes, know, I and in the old days, it was, it was the tip My turn, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, God for the circle. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, was the name of... By the first story. Yes. <laughs> By a happy place. Yes. Yes. There's a link here. Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. And I've just actually done that as an audiobook, but I wasn't allowed to play K-9. When you do Doctor Who audiobooks, the only characters the reader is not allowed to play are K-9 and Daleks. So that I read this in every word of this audiobook except K9's dialogue, which was read by none other than Jules. Why? Why aren't you allowed to do it? I have no clue. I think it's completely mad. I don't know. I think his family is to employ John because he's marvellous at it. I don't understand why the reader isn't allowed to do the voice of K9. It seems silly to me. Yes, but that's that's to me as well. It makes no sense to me. Who was publishing this? Was this the, the, the British the BBC, 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 the British Broadcast? Yeah. Who, who created K9? Well, K9 was a figment of the imagination of. Two writers, Bob Baker and Dave Martin. Well, maybe those two have... Well, in, but Dave Martin is no longer with us. Yes, but they have representatives on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose they do. Yeah, yes, the true. estate of... Yes. I mean, it's like, um, what's his face, Terry Nation has representatives on Earth who yes. guard his creations yes, assiduously. Absolutely. So maybe K-9 is similarly protected. It could well be. Yeah. I must talk work for you. Well, I must talk to my broker. Don't, don't complain. I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining. Complain. I was complaining. I don't want to say that. Because I want to play. I was talking I'm generically. Oh, no. oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm assuming Bob, Bob Bates still has a, has a stake in the. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, oh, yes. Uncle Bob. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob has a stake. Um, Which he uses to kill dumb fathers. With I. Probably. <laughs> And he's the fellow, isn't he the fellow who wrote Wright, Wallace and Gromit as well? He co-wrote Wallace and Gromit with Nick Park, yeah. Ah, yeah. didn't, didn't know, that. know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, so, the, the, you, as you know, Dave and Bob were known as the Bristol Boys. Or maybe you didn't. No. Um, Bob was here, I think, the last, the last convention. Oh, um, right. Was interviewed by some stories. Well, if I um, wasn't, then I didn't know about Well, it. so, well, no, you might have picked it up. So they were known as the Bristol Boys. That was their nickname in the, in the right. group after Dr. Who because they were in Bristol. So I, I somehow Bob and Nick Park met and that's how they got involved in Wallace and Gromit. So that's one of my other interests is animation. Um, Colin, right. Uh, well, let's see if I can hit you with this question that nobody's asked you before, which I, I don't think anybody will have, because it involves my sister's wedding. <laughs> so my sister got married three years ago and at the wedding I was introduced to a former BBC sound man. And I said, well, did you, did you do any Doctor Who? And he said, yes, I was, I was in, in studio during the Colin Baker era. And I said, well, can you tell me anything about what it was like working with Colin Baker as a sound man? And he said that you were, you were concerned with, with all that was going on. And there was a scene where you had to go over to a computer terminal and type something, but there was no dialogue. And you wanted something for him to do. So, so he, you said to him, I will kind of make some noise as I'm doing it so that you have something to to sound good. Do you remember this incident at all? <laughs> no, but I'm not surprised to hear it. I, yeah. um, I, I can imagine being like that, yes. Yeah. Um, was that part of your ethos as an actor in studio that you, you were Giving the sound match. Well, no, no, no. But as in... <laughs> as in yeah. uh, I, 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 I'm always, I think, when I'm on a set, aware of the needs and requirements of others. Yes. And... It might, I can't, I don't know the story behind that oh, yes. particular bit, but I, I, I can imagine hearing him say, do I have to follow this or yeah. something? And me going, well, I'll make some noises for you. I can imagine that. Yes. Um, but it, I don't think it was one of the major elements of my 
Times don't do that no. at the moment with the sound man. But it, just, it, just, it just struck me when he was telling me that, and what I picked up from you in the that I was a control freak. No, 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 not that you're a control freak. <laughs> but that you, you are a generous person um, and, and kind of caring about what, what is going on, not just with your performance, but with the. The, the, the crew and, and I, the crew working. I, I go on the old-fashioned basis that if everyone's enjoying themselves and having a good time, you do better work. Yeah. I, mean, I have worked with people who do not subscribe to that. Right. I've worked with people who think if everybody's on edge and terrified that they're mm. going to flip their lid, everyone will be, do some, the end result will be better. And it won't. It never is. Yes, it was extraordinary. I was in a play in the West End where the director suddenly decided to re-block the play, the rehearsal before the dress rehearsal, and the state of anguish that we were all in uh, was, to, it, because all they wanted to do was to create a kind of electricity between us, yeah. and of course the dynamic was a completely false one. We had built up where, where we were going and what we were going to, to do, and we were beginning to feel confident in what we were doing, and suddenly it was scythed away from the bottom, and we were just left adrift. And the, the, these are with big name actors as well, so you know. Well, I don't he was know. a big name director, but no names, no actors. It is funny how they, some directors don't get what acting is about. Yeah. When I was doing one of those, uh, are you aware of The Stranger, uh, which was a character yeah. that I did yeah. in between, well, during the hiatus? The long hiatus. A uh, young man by the name of Bill Baggs, who was in uh, many ways an industrious young fellow, decided he would make Doctor Who only call it The Stranger and cast me as The Stranger and Nicola Bryant as Miss Brown. You know, it was a fairly. Um, uh, what a disguise! Yeah. Right. <laughs> a fairly impenetrable disguise. <laughs> and, 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 and did some rather interesting little films. And there was one scene where I was suspended in some wires and tied up and throttled and uh, as I burst out um, he suddenly chucked a bucket of gunge over me which he hadn't told me about on the tape and I stopped, I got out, seized him by the lapels and said what was that about? He said, oh, I wanted to get a genuine reaction. <laughs> I said, what, me killing you? <laughs> And I said, never, ever, ever do that again. Gunge is to any actor as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, to any actor, because actors act. Mm. Yes. They pretend. If you say, I'm going to chuck some gunge over you, you think, right, I know I have to react to that then. But if you don't know the gunge is coming, mm. you tend to have a different reaction. Yeah. Uh, but it's like him changing all your moves. Yeah. It's ridiculous. No, good, good There's a lot of feedback going on. There is, I don't know. I could be the voice of her feedback. You could, yes. Who could do what about it? Whoever's up in the booth. Somebody's just done something. Wonderful. It's gone. Has it gone? No, it's still. Can we? Is that, it? Yeah. Well, I mean, this room's small enough, I can project. I thought the theatre's bigger than this, darling. <laughs> so that was quite an interesting question. Mm. I'm glad mm. that, that my chance encounter with this bloke at a wedding has given us some time to mm. talk. Um, <laughs> is your sister still married to this person? She is. Uh, they, uh, their first daughter is now eight months and How lovely. coming on. Are they so. coming on to this podcast? <laughs> uh, no, I think they will find themselves slightly surprised to have even been mentioned. mentioned. I see. Yes. Right. Just, um, just, well, just ask for information. Yeah. No. <laughs> cool. um, if I might ask Colin, you have recently uh, done, well, uh, perhaps not for you, but it's just been released, your final adventure. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? I think I'd better about? not. <laughs> well, no, the, well, when no. I was signing earlier today, somebody said, during your talks, please don't do any spoilers about the final adventure, because some people haven't heard it yet. So I won't do a spoiler, but it came about, uh, Nick Briggs has on several occasions said, we really ought to do your generation. And I've rather enjoyed for the last 30 years being the doctor who never had a regeneration, yeah. mm -hmm. and therefore 
Sylvester McCoy was an imposter. <laughs> uh, therefore, all those who succeeded him were all false popes as well. <laughs> so I was still the doctor from 1986 to now, which means I was a doctor for, gosh, 30 years, which is quite nice. Um, and Sylvester McCoy, floundering about in my coat, does not a regeneration make. No. <laughs> I was not there. So I also like the fact that the new, the new regime of doctors, starting with him as number one, had a very good number six again. Someone who is grumpy and unpleasant and <laughs> tricky mm -hmm. and unlikable. I like all that. Mm -hmm. But I have to surrender to fate. And Nick said, please, I will write you a good story. I said, well, write the story and I'll tell you if I'll do it or not. <laughs> and they did, and I didn't understand it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, actually. But, but the, he promised me it would be a good one. And I have to confess it is. And what's so clever about it and that's what's so clever about everyone at Big Finish, is that it doesn't in any way contradict that what we know already. Right. And it fits mm -hmm. in absolutely mm -hmm. seamlessly with the mm -hmm. moment when Sylvester McCoy falls rides, up a, rides around in a blonde wig in my, in my coat. <laughs> yeah. um, and then he disappears, as he always says. And I don't joke, uh, <laughs> Colin Baker's bigger than me. <laughs> 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 So that, yes, so it's good. And it's you, actually good. Have you had much feedback since it's gone out? People? An immeasurable amount of feedback, all of it complimentary. People like it. Um, people are kind enough. One chap today said he had to stop his car and park at the moment of my regeneration because he was moved. I think one can't ask for much more than that. Fantastic. And you presume you Stop looking at each other like that. <laughs> in disgust. Not at all. No, I, I, I love moving moments. <laughs> if, if, he, if he was moved, why did he stop? <laughs> I'm just, it, it's canine logic trying to work it out. I'm never. No, I take the point. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so, it's a terrible focus puller, that man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You, you have obviously regenerated many times as canine, but it's always been... By well, surprise, yes, really. Yeah. It, it's the, been the result of a phone call um, on many occasions. Uh, we're putting K9 back into this. Uh, are you free on Thursday to come in and do a... I'll go anywhere, do anything. Yes, fine, yes. You know, it, that's how it happened, really. And End of story. Is there, is there more for K9? Have you recorded anything that's not coming out yet? Well, isn't that interesting? Well, yes, next week, next week, um, and the week after, I'm doing a two-part story, Big Finish, um, written by John Dorney, mm -hmm. uh, with Tom mm -hmm. and Louise. Okay. So that'll be lovely. And that takes me back, you know, 38 years. Back since when I started. Locks of Massey. Locks of Massey. There you are. Going down to years. Tunbridge Wells, are you? Yes. Going down to Tunbridge Wells or thereabouts, yes. To Audio Sorcery is, is the name of the studios down there. They, they, they don't do quite such a good lunch as they do in the London studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> if there's a practical sandwich in Act 3, as most actors say, I'll take the part. <laughs> It'll save me having to buy my own soap. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, there's no lunch on earth as good as the lunch at most studios in London. It simply is the finest lunch to be found Absolutely. anywhere on this planet. It is. It's, it's unbelievable. Yes. So is, is that ultimately what drew you all back into the... Yes, yes. <laughs> the great Toby. Yes, yes, Toby. Toby Freichek Robinson. Yep. Who owns the studio, is the studio technician editor. And genius cook! Absolutely. Oh, so he makes the lunches? Yes. He, makes, he comes in yeah. at four in the morning and makes the lunches. Yeah. Mm. He's an amazing man. Mm -hmm. And a lovely guy. Lovely guy. An old rocker. Mm. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. Now, the other thing that connects the th three of you from Doctor Who, when I asked this to a panel last year... So we all worked on it. Well, you all worked on it, <laughs> but more specifically, you all worked on it under the, the JNT era. Indeed. Can you, can you share some memories of, of, of your time working with him? Stop no. With, no. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, he, was, I, I, he was great. Yeah. He was, he was fun, he was passionate about it, he really did care. There's no question about it, mm -hmm. he really cared about 
the programme and it was interesting and, and good. And um, and he calls me, so so obviously he's my friend and yeah. I speak well of him. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, he he was he was delightful and and uh, and he was a very very big presence. I mean, actually, a lot of producers, for instance, aren't actually in the studio. They're not sitting up in the box. Mm -hmm. It's not actually the producer's job necessarily to be there. Uh, but he always wanted to be very hands on. So every single day there was any mm. taping going on, John was there up in the box. Uh, mm. He was present, um, very intensely present and hands on at, at every level of the mm. piece, every level of the production. Yeah. Well, I, of course, came into the production in Graham Williams' era. Um, and I do remember um, my agent phoned up one day to me and he said, uh, I did the most extraordinary thing, John. I just had a call from the BBC. As though it was the most extraordinary, strange thing that agents should ever have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yes, well, it's they, it's a, a, from the Doctor Who office, Graham Williams. They want to know if you'd be free to play the voice of A, a tin dog, and B, a virus. <laughs> and I thought, well, a virus is only going to be a tiny little part. I'm used to playing bigger parts than that. But um, so I said, well, they explained that, of course, K9 was being written in only for one storyline. So uh, I went to see Graham. And Graham showed me the, the blueprints of K9, which was the model of group, uh, the, the, the mo module that is K9 was still being built. And he said, can you do a voice for that? And I saw, ah, and I could see on the blueprints there was a sort of tartan collar around K9's neck. So I thought, ah, you want it Scottish? <laughs> oh, no, 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 we don't want Scottish, thank you very much. So I said, well, well, what I'll do is I'll pitch the voice up an octave or two, and I'll clip everything so it just sounds robotic and perhaps make a few mistakes and things and have to recheck and recodify re and reconnect. And the voice turned out to be rather more like this, and it sort of stayed. And there you are, that was a canine's voice. Uh, but I left seeing Graham Williams, and went home, uh, not knowing whether I was going to get the parts or not, as, you, as many actors do, and expect no more phone calls or anything. It was anguish called three weeks after I'd been to see Graham from the BBC, from the, ten, the Doctor Who office, saying, have you accepted the part? We want to hear from you. Because I didn't realise at the time I was actually being offered it. It's very odd for actors to actually go and suddenly find that they are actually, <coughs> they're usually waiting in line <laughs> and hope to hear on the phone from their agents that they've got the part. There it is. So what did you think of JNT? Which is the question. Yes. <laughs> um, well, JMT was a very different broom uh, from Graham Williams. But again, and I can endorse everything that's said here about him because uh, he was intensely careful of his his little empire, if you like, of, of which we had the responsibility for putting what was becoming an increasingly popular show on the road uh, to its best advantage. Money was tight, money was always tight. Um, the BBC had the, the, the sort of feeling that, you know, if you can do it for that money, then you can do it for less. And so he was always fighting the BBC, the fight in the corner for, for Doctor Who from that point of view. There were some episodes, I remember, The Sunmakers, which is a lovely story, but you look at the sets and they're just sort of They'd fall down if you sneezed at them, you know. <laughs> really, very, very strange. But he was, uh, he, his heart was very much in the right place you know, for, for Doctor Who. But on the money thing, it's interesting that if you watch John Pearl Wee episodes, you'll see they did lots of helicopters and all that kind of stuff. By the time we were in it, they would, wouldn't have been able to get a helicopter and it would, it would, it would be completely out of the question to get a helicopter. We even had, I was in an episode where we had a steam engine, and they didn't hire a steam engine. We just stood there up to our knees in dry ice, and the steam engine is actually a bit of stock footage. Mm -hmm. um, so you look at, you know, proportionally, the budget ten years earlier was much higher than it actually was mm -hmm. when we were doing it. Yeah. And then I'm guessing it was even smaller, really. 
Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> and I, I adore John. Um, and he was unlike any producer I'd ever worked with before. Uh, maybe one or two in the earlier, I worked with a producer called John Con David Conroy back in the early 70s, who did mm -hmm. War and Peace, things like that. And he was very much the hands on, passionate producer. But most of the BBC producers I worked with were people who turned up at the read through, and by the time you got to recording it, you forgot what they looked like. <laughs> And you want to do that man with the suit was standing in your eye line. <laughs> and that was usually the producer. And then along comes John Nathan Turner, who just cared yes. about every element of it. Yeah. And of course I love him, because he cast me. He didn't ask me to audition or, or do, a, you know, to, to do a tape or anything. He said, would you like to play the part? How would you like to do it? And we talked about it. And he gave him the part. So mm -hmm. that is in kind of uh, liable to make you like a person mm -hmm. that they have that degree of confidence in you. And we may have had small differences over the years about things, but in the main, uh, I just thought his, his single-minded passion kept it going longer than it would have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. If yes, any other agree. producer had been producing, yes. they'd have seen yeah. the writing on the wall and got out. He fought for it. He dragged it across to America on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being at a convention in America when uh, John wasn't there on that one. And an American, uh, the man who ran Lionheart Television, mm -hmm. which was the um, merchandising arm of the BBC in America, said to me, hey, Carl, when you go back to UK, can you go see Mike Gray? Tell him we need more who. Mm -hmm. I said, you fundamentally misunderstand two things. One is the access an actor in a TV series in Britain as to the head of drama or the controller of television, which is zero, and B, that they care about money, which they didn't then. The fact the programme earned more than it cost to make meant nothing to the BBC yeah. at that time. Now it would, and now it does. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it hadn't been for John, you know, going out there and dragging us with him and making us do these conventions, Yep. Uh, uh, the, the love grew and it's still continuing to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I still miss him because we shared a sense of humour. Mm -hmm. The same things made us laugh. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I think, oh, I wish I could tell John that. Mm -hmm. There's something I knew would make him laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and in many ways, he was very similar to Russell T. Davis, who I've met a few times, who's another big, friendly, warm hearted, open hands-on man. Mm. And I think the programme's always thrived when it's had someone like that running it. Yeah. Because Russell was fantastic. Yeah. I only met him the once, but all the stories I've heard, yeah. he was built of the same material. Yes. They'd have got on very well. Yeah. I've often actually thought that John would have been thrilled by Big Finish. He would just have loved not only the Doctor Who is going on, mm. but that his doctors and his companions yes. are still living yes. fictional characters, yes. still living characters. Yeah. He would just have absolutely loved yeah. it. He, he really would. would. Yeah. Well, I think we all owe him quite a debt of gratitude. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Still, yeah. Well, we have about, I don't know, six, seven minutes left. So, any, oh, sorry, hit the mic. Any uh, audience questions? So I'll just repeat that. Uh, so when you were growing up, was there a, a TV show that you wanted to be a part of that you weren't, but n other than Doctor Who? Um, the, uh, the program that I loved, Dash, uh, the only program that was on television when I was a Doctor Who that made, I wanted to dash to the TV screen to see was a very bizarre science fiction series called Sapphire and Steel. Which I just absolutely adore. And I've actually got it on, on it, it's a program I had, I had on VHS and I've got it on DVD. So it's a program, one of the very few programs I've actually seen mm -hmm. several times in my life. I think it's absolutely bizarre mm -hmm. and genuinely brilliant. Have you ever seen it? Have you heard of it? It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's an extraordinary. Big thing. Finish doing it now. Uh, well, yeah, I, I've heard of Big Finish too, and, and they were actually. Yeah. What, for TV? Oh, yes. For TV. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, that, yeah. so I would love to have been a, 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 mm -hmm. done a little guest character at Sapphire and Steel. I really, I really would have loved it. Mm -hmm. John? Well, yes, I, I don't think I, 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 
I have any sort of grid. I, I don't think I have to pass on this one. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Cool. Well, of course, without a chart or two, it wasn't on. Um, <laughs> not much was, to be honest. No. And because when I was a child, the, the possibility that someone like me could be mm. an actor on television did not exist. Mm. So I never thought when I was watching something sense can now. Yeah. So you kind of post justify That's right. your love of post justification. Let's right. say, well, of course, I was aware of the rubbish sets. There you were. You loved it. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was real. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody uh, has actually watched every single episode of Doctor Who and counted the number of times the sets wobble. And apparently it's twice. In 28 <laughs> years, the sets actually wobbled twice. Yeah. Which is the equivalent of the not wobbling at all. Yes. Yeah. But uh, there, was one, there was one take I did. I think it was in Vengeance on Varos, where there was a series of explosions and I had to run down a corridor, open the door, and everyone went through, and I followed through. Uh, and then they saw something else come down the corridor. And we did all that, and as I, they all went through, I had on the wall and I realised if I moved it, the wall would fall over. <laughs> because as I started to move it, so I stayed there, and I let that thing go past in the background, thinking, well, this is all I can do. Then the clerk went up and said, Colin, my God's sake, I'm supposed to run through. I said, well, if I do, will you please go through the... I went through the door and the set collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, he said. <laughs> uh, Liam, yes, I think you're going to up. Colin, uh, just wanted again to thank you for doing the, the last adventure. Um, and was it your choice for the um, change of... <laughs> well, I, I love the fact that I've got to change my costume on audio. <laughs> it's just such a wonderful yeah. kind of world of Doctor Who thing. Ah, do you know, I'm getting quite fond of the costume now. I used to loathe it. Um, uh, I, when I was asked what I'd like to wear, I described virtually what Christian Reckleston ended up with. Nice long black coat, something you could disappear into the background. Uh, struck me the Doctor might occasionally wish to, uh, you know, not to be seen, and to wear what I was given was daft. And I also wonder why the Doctor had to wear a costume. Nobody else wears costumes, they wear clothes. Why couldn't the Doctor wear something different? Expense. Every episode, new clothes of the Doctor. No, one thing, you have to wear it. And it was the 80s, it was time of glam rock. No, it was after glam rock, wasn't it? It was new wave and all that nonsense. And it was kind of of its time. And if you look back at uh, the um, Top of the Pops of the same era, you'll see that costume was very work-a-day for the area, the era in which it appeared. And I now realise it did me a favour, because when children buy those little models, they like the colourful one, mm. and I get 0.001 of a penny. <laughs> um, so that helps. <laughs> and and, and it, 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 it does stand out, you know, it is different. Um, but I, I always wanted a different costume. A big finish said, would you like to give me one? And I said, yes, all right. And so I've got a nice blue one now. Mm. Was that, I can't was see it. it. So was that actually, was that actually, um, did you actually wear that? Or was that Photoshop? Uh, uh, no, I didn't wear it. I didn't wear it. Oh, right. Um, no, because it's <coughs> sound only, you see. I think we've got time for one final question. It's on, it's on audio, I think. Is there uh, anybody up there? Oh, yes. Um, I don't know. Oh. What do you want? Well, no, we, we, we have a pre-recorded message from a, a, a convention goer who has since moved elsewhere, and he's sent in a question for us to, oh, to listen right. to, but I don't know if somebody's up there ready to play it. If they can't be asked to come, I'm not answering their question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Here we go. Go <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> go. Hello. It's an honour to meet you. I wish I could be there in person, but I've recently moved to sunny, you've guessed it, Cricklewood. As I'm sure my good friend uh, has explained, that was me. That was me. I have a question <laughs> that I traditionally ask at Hooverville. If you would indulge me, I'd like to ask that same question, only this time using nothing but my voice. Television is changing. We are in uncharted territory. 
the public do not crowd around TVs to watch their favourite shows anymore. Instead, they do not crowd around computers. Streaming services such as Netflix or Amazon Prime or the dear old BBC iPlayer have changed the way that television is watched forever. Television has not rested upon its laurels, however. Such a radical shift in the way shows are consumed has impacted not only the way TV is made, but also the way it's written. The rise of the box set generation, and more recently those who choose the binge stream, has inspired a move to more arc-based storylines. For example, since its triumphant revival in 2005, Doctor Who has tended to make each series with just that in mind. Overnight ratings being crucial to the survival of a show is a thing of the past. And so, now on to my question. <laughs> all that I have just said is indeed true, and it is. Do you think it is ever acceptable to carpet a bathroom? <laughs> Thank you. tell you last night when I was talking to uh, um, St. Louis, Missouri from my hotel room, hotel room lighting was absolutely negative, I mean there was hardly any light at all, it was low key as anything. My face didn't appear on the face FaceTime panel on my tablet. So in fact I broadcast from my bathroom. <laughs> uh, Carpeted? No, <laughs> it wasn't. So I think that was a, probably a step in the right direction. Matthew, um, I actually, but personally, wouldn't wouldn't carpet the bathroom. Yeah. I wouldn't actually make him a fence to do so. The thing about a carpet is it is it is nice and, and warm on the feet. The trouble with a lot of the, the bathroom floors is that they're cold, which is ridiculous. Who wants to walk across? Just have a shower. You don't want to walk across a cold floor. You want to walk across a war, warm floor. So I can see the argument in favour of a bathroom, but I myself would make that choice. What would you like? I would make that aesthetic choice. Like to talk about the, the virtues of underfloor heating. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's time to stop. I think it is time to off on that bombshell. Yeah. Thank you very much, Colin Baker, John Lisa, and Matthew Walker. Thank you. <laughs> 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 right. Oh my. <laughs> 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 what happened to David? <laughs> 